Well, uh, why don't we actually uh, uh, begin by welcoming you guys uh, to our lecture, uh, the inaugural lecture that we have basically uh, called the Melvin Floor Lecture Series. And this is going to be the inaugural lecture within that series. Uh, and it is part of the Communication Research Center uh, series of lectures. Um, my name is Michael Asmar, I'm director of the CRC. And um, today it's actually going to be a very special day for us. Not only because we are inaugurating the lecture, but because we have a very special speaker with us today. Um, as you all know, we are currently in a transition uh, from a traditional distribution of news media, such as newspapers and magazines, to uh, digital uh, delivery through a range of platforms. Today, uh, Professor Stephen Lacey, who is a professor in the College of Communication at Michigan State University, will talk to us about that transformation. But this is not uh, his first digital trans transition. 35 years ago, 35 years ago, those of you who are younger than 35, you know, you know, 35 years ago, when he worked for newspapers, he went from writing on a royal manual typewriter, I don't know if you actually remember a royal manual typewriter, you might have seen it in museums, right? To writing on a computer. Uh, this was the digital production transition. Five years after the computers arrived in the newsroom, he was enrolled at the University of Texas, earning his PhD and studying the economics and management of news media. When the digital distribution of news became possible within the World Wide Web, his background in media economics led him increasingly to study a second digital transformation, the digital transformation or the digital consumption transition. He's particularly interested in how this transformation is and will affect coverage of local governments. His interest in media economics and technology has led to his writing or editing of six books publishing more than 90 referee journal articles and writing a dozen book chapters. He will share this background in the first Melvin the Floor Distinguished Lecture Series. And his title, the title of his presentation is Digital Journalism Framing Transformation and Understanding Impact. Please help me give a warm welcome to you. Actually, I, I know Mel before, and I am honored to be here for the first lecture because I use his material. I teach, uh, this semester I'm teaching a doctoral seminar who just finished reading some of his work. So I'm extremely honored. I want to thank Nina and Michael for, well, she's here somewhere, for, for, for taking care of me. Uh, it's been a wonderful trip, and I appreciate being here. Now, before I get started today, I want to talk a little bit about some of the terms. Because oftentimes we talk about these things and we think we share a meaning, and that's oftentimes not the case, which leads to some confusion. So when I talk about media, I'm really talking about the entire media business or industry. That includes entertainment, a whole range of things. And then when I talk about journalism, I'm talking about the part of media that are particularly interested in public affairs and community affairs. And it tends to fall into opinion and news. Both of those are very important, but they're also very different. And those are both part of what we're seeing on the web now, and we'll get into that to a greater degree. Framing is a hot research topic in mass communication these days. Uh, to keep it simple, I'm simply going to say that framing has to do with the context that's attached to concepts and trends by the media themselves. Right? So for example, this morning I got up, went to breakfast, I got the New York Times, open to the sports section, and I was examining the frames that had been associated with the end of the uh, Red Sox season. And so I saw a frame about Frank Coda not living up to his responsibilities. I saw a frame about pitchers eating chicken and drinking beer. I saw a frame about injury. These are all ways of adding context to these events. And obviously, they affect our perception of those events. And so that's what I'm going to be doing when I talk about framing today. And really, I'm going to talk about the way the media and journalism have been framing themselves. 
How are they framing this transition that's taking place? And actually, it's been going on for a long time now. And in doing that, I'm going to give you a couple of things. First frame I'm going to give you, I'm going to argue that it has, it's not the right frame for understanding. And then I'll give you what I think the right frame is, and then we'll talk about some implications of that second frame. Uh, now, you know, this is called a lecture. I am happy to be interrupted at any point to answer questions. You know, I've got this set of slides I can go through. But we can stop any time and discuss them. Uh, I see myself not as a futurist, although I think that's a cool title. Uh, I'm a social scientist. And so I based these possibilities on how probable they are. And I'm also smart enough to know that what I tell you is only a probability. It's the probability that I see. And other people may have other frames and other visions. So I'm happy to talk about that because it'll teach me something. Now there'll be questions at the end, but I don't mind questions any time. Okay? So don't, don't resist the urge, should it arise, that you want to ask me questions. Now, first question I want to ask myself, and you, if you want to answer, is why are frames important? Well, they're important in a variety of ways. The way that the media are framed, or are framed affects whether or not people will buy stock in media companies. Right? We don't want to buy anything, any stock in a company that's going to disappear in five years. We want to buy it in the, the new, in Groupon. Uh, Groupon's revaluing now. Uh, some people have lost a lot of money buying into stocks because of the framing. I'm actually old enough to remember the dot-com boom and the dot-com bust. Lots of money was lost because of the framing of the new technology at that point. Uh, since I teach in a journalism school, here's what we're encountering now. Uh, a really bright young high school student comes and talks about, I want to study journalism, I want to help the community, uh, I want to do something. I like to write. I like to, to deal with, uh, with other people. As soon as they turn away, the parents say, now, is my daughter going to get a job if the newspapers are dying? And that's a legitimate question. And it's a question that is being asked because of the frame. So that leads me to the journalism doomsday frame. <laughs> now, this is a little bit of framing here. You'll notice that we have a nuclear explosion on the far side. When I was growing up and spending way too much time in dark theater seeing science fiction films, that was the framing of Doomsday. We're all going to die in a nuclear explosion. explosion. Now, of course, we all know it's going to happen when a comet or a meteor hits the Earth and we go that way. Either way, it's Doomsday. It's the end. Now, some of the statements that are connected with this frame, journalism is dying, newspapers are dead, anyone can be a journalist <laughs> online, no one will pay for online content, especially journalism. Now, any of you, many of you are younger. This, this debate, this argument actually goes back a long way. Have any of you ever seen these things? You read them in a blog? or I, I've seen this in the New York Times. And so I want to use this to sort of go over this doomsday journalism frame and talk about how well that helps explain the future. So let's start with the idea of journalism is dying. Well, to be honest, that's ludicrous. Journalism is inherent and any social group that gets large enough that you can't talk to everybody face to face. The very first newspaper in this country had no advertising in it. They wish they did, but it had no advertising in it. The communities had reached the point where they couldn't talk with everybody, so they needed another form of communication, of sharing the information that is crucial. We're a huge country. We can't elect presidents, senators, without sharing information. So the idea that journalism will somehow disappear is ridiculous. What's not ridiculous is what form will it take in the future? And that's a legitimate question. And that gets to the second one, <coughs> newspapers are dead. Well, we'll do a little reality check. About 400 million copies of daily and weekly newspapers are printed every week in this country. That's about, what, 20 million a year? Now, that's nowhere near where it was 10 years ago. It has declined, and it will continue to decline. But that's far from being dead. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. On average, about 60% of adult citizens access newspapers in print or online on a given day. Now, again, that figure is smaller than it used to be. But the important thing is that it's online and in paper. One of the problems we have in our framing is that we think about newspapers as paper rather than news. 
almost every newspaper in this country is online now. Some are good and better than others, but they're there. Most of the large companies are now providing their news in almost any platform you can imagine. I told someone yesterday, now when I walk my dog, I read the New York Times on my smartphone. That's a way of accessing the news. It's still the same material that if I went home and picked up that paper I've got sitting there, and we take the paper because my wife loves the crossword puzzle. Or for that, we probably wouldn't take the paper anymore. But it's the same material. And so we've got to get away from newspaper and start thinking about news organizations or news outlets. As a matter of fact, they should have a contest. You give a million dollars to whoever can come up with the right term for the future of news. Somebody's got to have that money. It would help us all out. The last point, and this is an important point. Michael mentioned that I'm inter interested in local government coverage. We recently uh, did a study of local government coverage. We got a half a million dollars from the National Science Foundation. And we covered, we looked at all the coverage, citizen journalism, television, radio, newspapers, weeklies, dailies, everything we could find for 120 metropolitan cities and 119 suburban cities. And the question was, now, what's going on out there? What we found out is that if you live in a place like Boston, television was doing okay. They provided coverage of the local government. Radio, not as good. But what we found is that without the, the newspapers provided two or three times as much coverage about the local government as everything else combined. When we looked at the suburbs, if you do not have a weekly or daily newspaper, your city government was not covered by journalism. Not at all. And these were large and medium-sized suburbs. These were not tiny suburbs. Some of these suburbs had 100,000 people, 50,000 people, 30,000 people. And without newspaper, there was no sharing of government news. So newspapers continue to be crucial, and we'll get back to this as to why in a little bit, in terms of the coverage that they're providing. Now, part of the problem in this frame is that people see newspapers as still being a mass media. In 1992, uh, some colleagues of mine and I put together a big newspaper research journal about the future of newspapers. It didn't have anything to do with the internet. It had to do with the growth of cable. And actually, some of those articles continue today. One colleague who since retired from Wisconsin wrote an article, and the question was, are newspapers mass media or class media? Increasingly, they're becoming class-oriented. Here's some data I pulled from Advertising Age. And this was from the Middleton Affluence Behavior Study. And what they did is they, they looked at households, 1,000 households, who made more than $100,000 a year. That's roughly the top 20% income in the country. And if you look at it, you see some interesting results. People still read, at the high end, about a newspaper. But they do everything else as well. Now, interesting, they took the subpart, and unfortunately they didn't say how large this is. This is about 1,000. The subpart of 18 to 34. And you see similar patterns, but they're evolving in different ways. So still 70% of these younger people look at a newspaper during the past week. But you also see that a lot more are viewed them on computers, tablets, e-readers, smartphones, all the different platforms that are available. Sure, yeah? Um, what does the overlap tell you? So more than 100% is viewing like a newspaper on in a hard copy and on a computer. As a matter of fact, there was this there was a study that found that uh, uh, two-thirds of the people who read a daily newspaper online also read a print version. Uh, it, and what it tells you is that people at the higher socioeconomic levels access information in multiple platforms. Why? Well, they can afford it. And we're going to come back to that when I get to the, to the other frame. Important part of this is that if you look at the lower ends of income, say under 30,000, it's somewhere in the 20% of people who look at a newspaper. And we'll come back to this and talk a little bit more about what all this means in terms of the media. But newspapers are increasingly moving away from being mass media. And there are reasons for that that, that we'll talk about. But the point of all of this is that newspapers, while they are changing, we're certainly not dying at this point. 
paper is still a remarkably convenient, versatile medium. Now that's changing, and it's going to change probably because of tablets and e-readers. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just saw a study that someone wrote about last week that said that people who move to e-readers actually read more news, 60 some odd percent said they read more news when they started using the e-reader than they did before. And so it's promoting reading of text. To some degree, we're, we're, we're getting to the idea not of print, but of text. Text versus other types of presentation tools. Okay, well let's go back to that list. Anyone can be a journalist online. Well, as a former journalist, I do find that a little insulting. It's a little bit harder than I want to be a journalist. Uh, but even if you accept that interpretation, the question becomes, well, how has citizen journalism affected journalism in general? So I want to look at citizen journalism. In the past four years, I've been part of three studies that have looked at citizen journalism. Uh, two of them were funded by Pew and Knight. Uh, we looked, the first study, we looked at 15 cities, then we looked at 46 cities. In that NSF uh, uh, project I told you about, we also looked at citizen journalism. And these are consistent conclusions that came out of those three studies. First of all, citizen journalism tends to be a large city phenomenon. For example, in the NSF study, we looked at 109 citizen journalism sites, and we measured their coverage of city government, county government, etc. 92% of the articles about local government that were on citizen journalism sites were about the large cities. Very few of the suburbs have citizen journalism sites. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. They're probably on the time we have today, but it is a large city phenomenon. It's not spread out throughout the country in any even sort of way. Most of what you find in citizen journalism have to do with opinion and not news. There are some news sites and that is there are citizen journalism sites that are trying to emulate traditional journalism where they're doing independent fact-based reporting. In that 109 sites we looked at in the NSF, two-thirds were opinion, basically blogs. One-third were news sites. Out of that 109, uh, 48 actually provided some coverage of city government. And it was split evenly, 24 blogs and 24 news sites. So it's mostly opinion. Posting can be erratic, and if you all read blogs or, or news sites, you know this. You may post three times during a week and then not again for two weeks, etc. And the reason is people are not being paid to do this, and they have lives. So it's tough for you to put in the same hours that you might if you were being paid for. Simple as that. Also, they tend to be easy enter, easy exit, and this is sort of classic economic theory. Uh, the 46 city study we did, we went back six months later, and 16% of the sites we looked at had not posted within three months, or had disappeared entirely. So it's easy to start these sites because it's relatively inexpensive. It's not always, always easy to maintain them, and occasionally we would run across, uh, across someone who left a reason that they're shutting down. Often it had to do with the fact that they, it was taking away from their work, they were leaving town, they wanted to spend time with their children, there are all sorts of reasons. Most citizen journalism sites, by definition, are voluntary. That the, the citizen journalists tended to be what we call strong gatekeepers. It was much harder to upload content to these sites, whether it was text or photographs or anything, than it was to commercial news sites. They, they simply were not allowing this huge flow of citizen input online. What we found with the NSF study is that the commercial news sites and the commercial newspapers were more likely to publish content from citizens than were the citizen sites. Not only that, when they wrote, wrote stories, the citizen sources, there were more citizen sources in the commercial news than on the citizen journalism site. And this is not an indictment. There's some wonderful journalism citizen sites out there. Uh, Richmond, for example, um, has about a dozen sites that are neighborhood sites and, and they get together and they network and they share their news and they provide coverage that the commercial <coughs> papers simply cannot and will not cover. So there's some great examples out there to look at, but the reality is that at best, citizen journalism is a complement to and not a substitute for traditional source of news. Okay, so people will not pay for content online. Uh, some of us in the audience are old enough to remember when cable came in, and this was one of the things that the broadcast people said, well, we don't need cable. 
Why would anybody pay for television? Is there anybody in here who doesn't pay for either broadband, cable, or satellite? There might be some of you. Do you? Okay. Do you watch television broadcast? Online. Oh, uh, anywhere? Do you watch it online? Yeah. Okay. Are you paying for broadband or are you, you steal it? Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. So online to cable. I've got two daughters who live in Ann Arbor. Neither one of them take cable. I think they have Netflix or something, but they don't. They don't take cable. They don't take satellite. They watch whatever they want to watch by downloading it or pulling it off the internet. Uh, but you're still paying for that access to my phone. And, I mean, we could all just go on and watch broadcast for free. It's even digital now. But we don't do that. And there are reasons for doing that. Uh, many of us are probably old enough to remember Napster and when we people would not pay for music online. Well, it was April 28, 2003, when iTunes Music Store went out. And earlier this month, they sold their 16 billionth Song. Matter of fact, between February 2010 and October 2011, they downloaded six billion songs from the website. Now, Steve Jobs, God bless his soul, and Apple are making about $5 billion a year because they do not believe the myth that people will not pay for content online. Those newspapers that people are reading now, about 40 million households still subscribe to newspapers. So, as a matter of fact, I just saw an article a couple days ago. The New York Times website, and in March they put up sort of a partial paywall. Uh, September unique visits compared to a year before were up 2.6%, even though they put up the paywall. There was an article, I think this morning or last night, on the, the, the Pointer blog. And increasingly, as newspapers are putting up paywalls, they're not finding this, this drastic reduction in, in uh, visitors to the website. Not nearly as doomsday as was predicted when this experiment started. So the point of, is that some people will pay for content online. But first you have to ask. If you don't ask, they won't pay. We're not entirely dead out here in the consumer world. So now I want to move on to an alternative frame. And I'm going to call it the business frame. Ever since 1833, when the first <coughs> address newspaper, most news, most journalism has been commercial. For better or worse. That's the reality. When I was a graduate student, I worked with a historian, and we studied the populist press at the end of the 19th century. And even those newspapers, which were politically oriented in their creation, were commercial enterprises. The family was trying to make a living. So the reality is that media, journalism, is primarily a commercial process, for better or worse. Now, under this business frame, here's something that a lot of people don't realize. Much of what has happened to journalism in the past three years has had to do more with the recession than with the transition to digital delivery. Actually, a lot of digital delivery existed before the recession. But the impact of that has been so huge, not quite as great as happened with the Great Depression when two or three hundred newspapers went under. But for example, in three years, 200 newspapers reduced the number of days a week that they provided print copies by at least one. They cut back to save costs and they're depending upon their online content to try and keep those people coming in. So that's an important thing to, to realize. But I want to talk about the idea of what a business frame is. In the coming years, these are the elements that are important and help explain a lot of what's going on. Every business has to deal with geography, particularly journalism, the media. Now, I live in East Lansing, Michigan. We, we actually sort of have a little weekly, but it covers a wide area. But we've got the Lansing State Journal. Now, anybody in this room can go online and read the Lansing State Journal. I'll bet you money that most of you will never do that because it's not of interest to you. Media define their geographic market by the content they, they create. So it doesn't matter if you can read it all over the world unless it's content that is interesting all over the world. So geography is always an element of the business frame and explains a lot of what happens online. Second is convenience. Steve Jobs made a fortune because he understood that consumers want convenience when it comes to interacting with technology. And if you look at all of the things that Apple invented, they made things more convenient, they made things easier. Microsoft was interested in selling us bundles of stuff, where if one program didn't work, the whole computer would fall apart, we couldn't do anything. Steve Jobs developed dedicated technology, iPods to listen to music, iPads to do consumer things. 
Most of us are not going to sit down and, and run SPSS, those of us who do research, on an iPad. No, it's a consumer device. It's for watching television, it's for listening to music, it's for reading newspapers, it's for reading books, it's for doing all of those things, but it's consumer oriented. So he understood that technology in the long run, in the long run is used as consumers want to use it, not as the producers want it to be used. So convenient. Habit is something, of course, we all consume media through habit. We watch the same television programs. We get more power now in very when, but we watch them. Some of us continue to read newspapers at the same time, etc. Convenience and habit together are very strong things. Uh, I, I teach a course, Introduction to Mass Media, or, or I used to teach it, and about eight years ago, I had a, a guru of online journalism come in, and, and she was talking about how print was dead and, and all of you are going to work for, for uh, online news organizations, which there's some truth to that. But then she said, how many of you read newspapers? And 90% of the students raised their hand. And it sort of took her back because this was not what she was expecting. And so she thought, she said, well, you, you all are not normal. And, and I said, Ask, is that a compliment? Or, but anyway, I, I explained to her later, later what happened. I have a 9 o'clock class. Now, at Michigan State, 9 o'clock class, students probably woke up at 8.30, and they picked up a cup of coffee on the way, maybe, if they actually got up at 8.30 instead of 8.50, to make it to class, and there's this big stack of free newspapers right outside the door to the lecture hall. So rather than use our computers or smartphones, they just pick up a copy of that paper, they go in and they browse through it, and they throw it on the floor for the janitor to worry about, and it was convenience. It wasn't because they prefer paper, to digital. I mean, I've got two daughters who are in their 20s, and they use everything. They read books, they read, you know, they're, it's interesting, as they've gotten older, Facebook has become less important, but still, they use every sort of medium that you can imagine, and it all works to their convenience. You know, they don't email much anymore. I have to, uh, I have to use my smartphone to get to them. <laughs> Last thing I want to talk about is the idea of content. In the long run, it's content. Now, I listen to, my computer has iTunes. So when I sit at work, I listen to music. And once upon a time, I listened to some of that music, the older part, on the record. And then I use tapes. And then I use CDs. And now I use iTunes. It's the music that makes the difference. Uh, you know, I, I, if I want to hear Lady Gaga, which I've downloaded now, <laughs> um, if I want to hear Bonnie Raitt, I want to hear Bob Dylan. Whoever I want to hear, it's not the technology, it's the music. And that's true of most content. I've watched Citizen Kane on almost any medium you can imagine, including this laptop, and it's still a great film. Right? So content. And if you're going to create content, there are two things you have to do. If any of you want to start your own websites, take this to the back. You have to have value. The people you're looking for, you have to produce something that they want that they value, that they will spend their time with, or they will spend their money on, or they will do both. And if they don't value it, you're out of business. It has to be scarce. And this was one of the problems that happened with newspapers. They didn't make their content scarce. Anybody could find it. Now that's happening. They're enforcing copyrights. They're, they're forming agreements with online companies to try and control their content. If it's not scarce, people won't pay for it, right? So you make it scarce, you put up paywalls, you ask them, you find a reasonable price, and if they value it, surprise, you make money. Now, they're never going to make the money they used to. And that's something that has to be understood if you're going to be in the business. But this is the business frame. So this is a frame, I think, that works a lot better than the doomsday frame. Uh, and if we want to talk about why there's a doomsday frame, we can always talk about that, because there's always been doomsday frame. There were doomsday frames when radio came along, when television came along, probably even when magazines came along. So let's talk a little bit about the political impact. Now this is 2012. Next year is going to be an extremely interesting time. Uh, I thought the last election was interesting, but this was going to be even more so. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit, speculate about two geographic levels or areas, federal and state, and, and then refer to some of these uh, the sort, different sorts of media that would be about. We're going to see a huge boom in social media. It's going to be the social medium election. Uh, everybody thought the last one was, but this is going to be the one. Now, it's not going to be to change minds. It's going to be to raise money. It's going to be to activate the base. 
They're not going to change any minds with Facebook, but they may get you to vote. They may get you to send in a check for $10, $20, $50, whatever you can afford. So it's going to be huge. Facebook, Twitter will be ringing with politics. An interesting thing is we're going to see some efforts to play the system. Why? The internet is like an echo chamber. And, and if you, you might try this sometimes. If you go and you, you, you search for something, and then you go in and look at how they're written about on the various sites. The interesting thing is you'll almost see the same thing, site after site after site. And they probably stole it from Wikipedia. As a matter of fact, I've, I've done a little bit of looking at that, and that's a common sort of thing you'll see. It's the same content. So it's like an echo. Why? Because we've got so many places to go on the internet that you don't go everywhere. But if it's the same content, you get this echo effect. Traditional media are more like a megaphone. And they expand it beyond the internet. And so what we're going to see is political parties or candidates try and get traditional attention by emphasizing how good they are with social media. Even the Weather Channel is into social media now. So, so it's a big thing. There's going to be a, a, a gaming of the system. So everybody's going to have a lot of friends. Everybody's going to have a lot of followers. And they're going to try and turn that into coverage by traditional media, especially cable channels. They, they do a lot of, of all sorts of things. Uh, commercial journalism and party information will be plentiful at the federal level on all platforms. There's going to be a huge amount of money spent on advertising that change the election laws. Corporations and unions can, can do ads now. And they can do them up to the very day before the election. And so we're going to see a huge amount. This is going to be seen as an ideological battle. And it's going to be nasty. And it's going to be a lot of stuff out there. If, if you want to buy, it may be too late. You should have bought television stock. Because TV stations and TV networks are going to be inundated with political advertising next year. It's just part of the system now. Um, Citizen opinion will be more plentiful than in the past, but there's going to be so much of it that most people won't pay attention to blogs unless they're on some, if they're on Salon or the New York Times or if they're some sort of larger sort of media outlet. We're going to see a lot of rumor. There will be a lot of swift votes floating this year. Most of the rumor will turn out to be incorrect, but it's so easy to put it out there now in an effort to try and get that megaphone effect. And even if it's not true, once it's out there, keeps ringing forever. So I suspect it is going to be fairly nasty. We're going to see a lot of rumors flying in all directions about all sorts of things. Uh, but that's just part of it. At the state level, uh, we're going to see the use of social media, but to be honest, states are less sophisticated than the federal level. They don't have as much money, and not as many people care. We are going to see the same sort of intense advertising because we discovered in 2010 that you can affect the system a lot at the state level. Think of Wisconsin. Think of Ohio, not where I live, uh, where one party took over the state house and the legislature and they could do what they want. And so there's going to be a lot of national money pouring into those state elections. Because, as a matter of fact, I don't know if any of you watched the prohibition, uh, uh, Ken Burns prohibition. One of the interesting things is, is uh, once they got through Congress and the Senate, uh, they said, well, it's going to be five years. you got five years, and, and you probably won't even get to the states. they got to do the states in 13 months. Because states are easier to manipulate than the federal government. So we're going to see a lot of that, I think, at the state level. TV stations are going to make a bundle. Uh, commercial news coverage, traditional coverage, is going to be less than it was. One of the results of the recession has been a pulling back of state coverage. There are very few large newspapers who still have a bureau in the state capitol, or at least a bureau the size they had 10 years ago. We're going to see a lot of Associated Press, but not a lot of variety in cover of the state uh, elections. Citizen journalism blogs might make up for some of that, but it's not going to be news, it's going to be opinion. And so there's going to be less news about state elections than ever. Unfortunately, television stations have, have, don't have a history of doing that sort of thing. They don't have beats, typically, and so they're not going to fill in. So we're, we're not going to have as much coverage at the state level as we were used to. I have no idea what that's going to mean, but I think that's what we're going to see. Now, overall then, the federal election will be rich with news coverage and advertising. The state will be a little bit less so. It's going to be the year of social media, but it's not clear yet what that would mean. If there's a big amount of politics flying around on Facebook, is that going to make a difference in how people perceive it? You all know they just changed Facebook, and, and wow, you know, it's, it's like a shocking dog. <laughs> it's like, well, what have you done? What have you done to our Facebook? And of course, Google Plus is out there trying to pull you in. 
So it's going to be an interesting time to see what happens with social media when, when the old folks like me get in there and try to take it over for commercial or political reasons. Okay, well let's move on. Looking to the idea of long run implications of the business spring. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the finance and then a little bit about the, the political and voter stuff. Uh, we're going to have a lot more news outlets enter and leave. We're going to see old companies leave, new companies come along. It's not clear what that's going to mean, but I, I think it's going to be interesting. And if they find new ways of helping us understand the world, that'd be great. So a lot of experimentation. Our media habits are going to have to change and adjust to all of this newness. But that's what it is. Easy entry, easy exit. Consumers will have to contribute more revenue to maintain the quality at the local state levels if we're going to maintain that. I don't know if they're going to do it, but they will be asked to. Uh, I think those higher income folks will. Uh, you know, to be honest, I'm not even sure what I pay to get the New York Times delivered on my doorstep. It's probably a lot, and I will pay more because I don't have access to a lot of that information in, in East Lansing, Michigan. If I don't get the New York Times, I can read it online. But my habit is usually to read it in the morning while I eat my oatmeal. So that's my habit. That's the time when I can do it. I, I will pay more. I don't know if the people there. One of the things, in a discussion of uh, paying on, on the internet with, with students in my class, one of the things I tell them is when you're young, you have more time than money. When you're old, you've got more money than time. And that explains the difference in terms of our media behavior when it comes to buying things. I never really downloaded music because I would have to go in and get the software and pay attention and all that. So on Amazon, I don't want that. And they send it to me. I got more money than time. So a lot of it comes down to how efficiently we make the media serve our purposes. One of the things you will find is that the way you deal with the world will change as you get older. As you accumulate responsibilities, those change. There is this myth that once upon a time, young people read newspapers all the time. And that is a myth. It was a myth when I was young 40 years ago. It remains a myth today. And to be honest, it was always a myth, unless you go back to the 30s and 40s, well, even before that, when there wasn't radio, the only thing you've had is a newspaper. And that's how you view the world. So it doesn't surprise me that young people don't spend a lot of time in newspapers. I didn't. Most newspapers are local. Most of you are not connect connected to that local community. I pay taxes in East Lansing. I care about East Lansing government. My children went to school in East Lansing. I care about East Lansing schools. But if I'm a student at Michigan State, why in the world do I care about that? I don't, which is perfectly fine. Someone wants to sell things to them, they have to create value. And that's what our student data newspaper does. It's just about the university. It's just about the things that the students are interested in because it's written and run by students. So, okay. The FCC is going to loosen cross ownership rules, I think, market by market. Now, you all may not know, but in most markets, uh, the newspaper cannot own a TV station. Not all, there's the grandfather now. Uh, they're dealing with this now, I, I think, and this is, this is just a guess. We, we've shared some of our data with them, and, and uh, this NSF group, there were five of us, and we, we talked with the, some of the folks at the FCC. And the reality is, in a market like Boston, if, a, if the Globe bought a TV station, it really wouldn't make a huge difference. My market, there are really two TV newsrooms, one newspaper. Two of those combined, it would reduce the number of reporters probably by a third in my market. So that's a concern. If I go to Greenville, Michigan, there's one newspaper, there's one radio station, same person, same family owns the both. If they didn't have the radio station, it would not exist. Because they, people tried to keep that radio station going for years. The newspaper bought it, they're able to keep it going. Although to be honest, they probably subsidize it. It's not making much money, but it's their community, and so they keep it going. So I think we're going to see some changes. I think they're going to loosen up, and I'm not sure that will be a problem in all markets. It might be a problem in some. But, you know, other than comments, they don't ask me to make those decisions. Uh, commercial news. Profit margins are never going to go back where they were. It's going to be low. That's one of the reasons quality will decline in some areas. Uh, successful citizen journalism will be associated with neighborhoods or interest groups. So you're not going to have big citizen journalism sites. News organizations, and they're trying to do this now, and I think they're going to become more successful with, with it, is they're going to incorporate more content from the citizens in their communities. It's free content, actually. It's not only free content, it's content that they care about. And so there's going to be more of an effort. There have been a lot of efforts. Some have been better than others. And we studied the Dallas area, and that was, that was terrible. Uh, the only things we ever saw loaded from citizens were what a great kid I got. Uh, 
It may have changed it since we looked at it two years ago. Okay, what will journalism look like? News will be available on all platforms, all presentation, et cetera, especially local. Right now, it's true for the national level. You can get anything you want anywhere, anytime. Not so true at local. And ours is a local press system. Most of those newspapers that are bought and read are at the local level. We really don't have any national sorts of newspapers. Uh, and of course, these are news sites. They have video, they have audio, they have photographs. And interesting, all the TV sites now look a lot like the newspaper sites. Everybody is doing everything now because they're all competing for attention from the same people. General assignment versus specialty journalism. Uh, television's always been general assignment. You come in, they say, go, go cover this. Newspapers have had a beat system. You come in, you go to City Hall, you go to the, the school building, you go to the police station, you, you, you cover a particular area. There's an important difference. Specialty reporting actually does a better job of balancing things and getting more depth than general assignment. But general assignment is cheaper. And we've seen that traditional newspaper sort of approach, I'm sorry, the traditional TV approach move more and more to newspapers as you cut more and more staff. And so I think we're going to see more of that, unless, of course, people are willing to pay more, which will allow them to go to a specialty. These organizations uh, will invest in quality multimedia, but it will vary greatly. It's going to be less investigative reporting simply because there's not going to be the money to fund it. It'll still happen at the best large newspapers. Medium-sized newspapers are probably not going to be investing in it. Unless we can figure out some sort of nonprofit way and, and the Knight Foundation and other foundations keep working on that, I'm not sure we've discovered the right, right way yet. Interactivity will grow in importance, but it's not really clear just what it's going to do. It has a lot of potential. I've done some studies looking at comments. And if you all look at comments online, uh, they vary as to how serious folks are. Um, although some newspapers, we have seen a community sort of gather around comments and they form their own community and they display some elements of community and groups online with their comments. So there's potential there. I think it's great. I think it's a way of keeping in touch with community and making what you do better. You've got to figure out how to do it right. And I'm not sure newspapers have done that yet. Media voters very quickly. I'm going to show you something here. This goes back to 1940. This was a study done of election in 1940 in Erie, Ohio. And they studied for six months. They went in and interviewed these people to see how they were going to vote and how they changed their minds. And here's what they decided. Out of these, uh, out of these people, out of these 600 people they studied, only 8% were converted by campaigns. Those were reinforced, activated, had no effect, reconverted. So the idea of the rational voter, someone who evaluates and draws a conclusion, was not found in that study some 60 years ago. Matter of fact, here was a summary. The people who did the most reading and listening were the ones that were least likely to convert and change. People who were most open to conversion didn't read and listen. Now, this is not the way our democracy is supposed to work. But that's what they found then, and I think it's still going on today. I think this is quite applicable. Uh, so, the trend of assessing news that supports our predispositions will work. This is the Fox and the MSNBC effect. People watch the things they already believe because it makes them feel good. It displaces or it solves their cognitive dissonance of looking at the world. They see the world and they're scared. So they go to what they want to hear and they hear it and they feel good about it. This trend will accentuate by incorporation of social media. How much diversity are you going to get when your friends are telling you what you should be reading and looking at? Probably not a lot, right? Because they're your friends. You share things. Social media is not going to make our world broader. It's probably going to narrow it if we turn just to social media to get our recommendations of what we're going to read and what we're going to look at. And again, I mentioned the fact that people are going to be bombarded by advertising on all platforms, et cetera, but probably not through print. Print is still struggling when it comes to advertising. So I think what we're going to see, and we're already there, I think, in, in most of the world, the press systems, the news systems, are upscale, downscale. So if you go to London, you've got tabloids, and you've got Financial Times, the high end, right? You've got the quality journalism, and you've got the not-so-quality journalism. If you go to Mexico City, you've got Reforma, you've got Metro. Metro is scandal, it's sports. Reforma is serious, the New York Times in Mexico. And I think we're there here. In, in, in our country, our press system didn't evolve that way because advertisers found it more efficient to have one newspaper in a town that would reach everybody. And so once upon a time, we had all of these newspapers that disappeared slowly because of advertisers. 
it was in their interest to get rid, not get rid of, but to move their support to one newspaper. And so we evolved to where we have basically in most cities now one newspaper. I think what we're ending up with is an upscale, downscale, but upscale is going to be text oriented. Those people who make $100,000 in their household, et cetera. So we're going to have an upscale that's going to be not exclusively text, but mostly text. Right? Because that's how you deal with complicated issues. Downscale is increasingly going to be video based. Emotional appeal, sports, scandal, all of those sorts of things. To some degree, that's what's happened with cable news. And so I see that happening now if it's not there already. Now, there are some implications to that, things like knowledge gaps. But still, I think that we're getting there. It's natural to segment the systems. And I think eventually that we're going to get there. So I don't want to leave you without a doomsday break, right? Uh, again, as I said, I grew up watching sci-fi, and I still enjoy a good doomsday uh, movie on television. So here's what I, I am concerned about. If I had to do a doomsday, it would be dysfunctional electorate. If the electorate becomes more fragmented and segmented, we sort of sink into our own groups, we avoid conflicting information, and the media are beginning to take advantage of that. And as we move towards more video, emotional sorts of appeal, you get an educational system that tends to teach towards standardized exams, they're not really interested in teaching analysis, in writing, then I see an electorate that maybe is not fitting that idea that Thomas Jefferson had. And the politicians and the media are, are feeding into this. One of the great things that people who want to control power have discovered over the centuries is that if you want to control people, you use fear. You can be afraid of the other, you can be afraid of the economy, you can be afraid of the other party, you can be afraid of change. You can be afraid of a lot of things. Politicians have long known that. The media are catching on to it, particularly on television. And so you have this catering to our fears. And my concern is that we as voters and we as media consumers won't stand up and say, wait a second, I want something better than that. I don't want to just read things that are fearful. I want balanced, fair, complete information in a context that gives it meaning. And so ultimately, I think, if we want to summarize what's going on, um, we can sort of paraphrase uh, Shakespeare or Bacon or Marlowe, whoever wrote it, uh, Julius Caesar, and simply say, uh, uh, See, the fault, dear citizens, is not in the media, it's in ourselves. And I think in time, citizens get the news media that they deserve. So, thank you very much. Well, we have a few minutes left. Uh, any questions? Disagreement? You can tell me I'm full of it. I may or may not believe it. Depends on your argument.
newspapers. Uh, our, our newspaper companies wish they could have those sorts of penetration. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. Would you say it's the most effective thing that we could do, every one of us, to prevent ourselves from becoming dysfunctional members? Yeah. <laughs> well, I do think that, that, uh, that the Founding Fathers had it right, that a democracy where decisions are based as much on rational decision making as possible, that doesn't mean ignoring emotion, but it means taking all of the things into consideration. Uh, we, we are very habitual in most of our behavior, uh, not only media, and it's because it's efficient. Yeah, think, think about it. Think if you had to get up every day and think about, well, what am I going to read or watch today? Or how am I going to get to school today? Or how am I going to, so we take these, these cognitive shortcuts. So I would simply say expose yourself to a variety of things and what you experience and what you read and what you watch and who you know. I grew up in the South where segregation was legal when I was young. Uh, and to be honest, I was denied a great deal of uh, knowledge from only having the ability to deal with people who are just like me. And so, yeah, I, I look at campuses and I see de facto segregation among groups of people, you know, no matter what the definition of diversity. And it's terrible. And we, we just don't spend time with people who think differently, who act differently, who have different cultures than we do. So just that alone would go a long way, I think, towards improving democracy. It's good. You, you all probably realize, I hope, that right now, if you define our population by race and gender, there is no majority. There is no one group that has 50%, and that's going to only become more diverse. So how can we have a country that runs when we don't learn about people from different cultures and different backgrounds, et cetera, than ours? And so yeah, I would say learn everything you can and enjoy that process. And when you're young, it's a lot cheaper to do those things than when you get older and you get family, et cetera. So that's what I do. Other questions? Comments? Yes. Point had to, had to do with the use of language. First of all, you should have some richness in the mistakes that occur. Uh, when Michael introduced me, me, he referred to the first digital uh, revolution of change in the newsrooms. One of the things that happened is back then you actually had a series of people who looked at the copy before it went out. So I wrote it on a royal typewriter. Somebody had to go keyboard it in the back, and they could catch mistakes I made. If you were in a, a larger newspaper, you had an editor, and maybe someone who actually read the, the the, the galleys when they came out. So there were more layers of protection. What that first transition of digital did in production side is make a lot of money for news companies. Because what happened is you fired more people. You had fewer people putting out a newspaper. Fewer people meant fewer people to check the errors. And as I said in class this morning, there was a study done by American Society of News Editors in 1999. They surveyed 3,200 people across the country and they asked them what is the biggest problem that destroys credibility for you. And the biggest problem was error. Simple error. Misspelling names, getting facts wrong. Because people say to themselves, if they can't spell my friend's name right, what else are they doing wrong? So to some degree, that uh, those errors happened because the companies wanted to take those savings from digital creation, production, put it into profit rather than putting it back into the newsroom. Because they didn't have to get rid of people who could read it one more time. They chose to do it because they, they could. So you're absolutely correct. I've got a couple of colleagues in Michigan State and they have their, their wall of shame and it's full of newspaper and magazine examples of problems with grammar and syntax, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? Well, that's um, a response to what you said. Um, you know, grammar, Right. So I think 
much as incorrect, it's are you confusing people who are paying you to do it? So, so if you're just writing for your friends, this is not a problem. You start writing for a larger audience. For example, the first newspaper job I had, I was 26. I got plopped down into a little town in Texas, and there was this gigantic recall of the city council. And I didn't know anything. I understood grammar, but I had to learn what I was doing. I had to learn to communicate with people that were totally different than I was. And so in some cases, you're absolutely right. If you're writing something for people who are in this age group and understand it's not a problem. If you're writing for a larger group, then it may be a problem. But that's something you have to learn. And, and, and to be honest, we're all free, so that if, if, it doesn't, if you don't want to do that, that's fine as well. And, and it may be that you carve out a niche by writing in a way that just, just speaks to certain groups of people. So I, I'm not even sure that it's a matter of, uh, yeah, there is right or wrong according to rules of grammar. But if you're trying to make money, I'm not sure if it's right or wrong. It's just a question of who you're writing for and whether or not that confuses the issue. One more question, guys. Yes, sir. Well, uh, uh, first of all, the gap's not as bad at the local level as it's the state. Because people will pay for local information, and they'll pay for national. It's the state level where I think that things are worse. And we're actually, we, we've applied for a grant to study this. I don't know yet if we're going to get it. Uh, but but uh, we have a, a group, a class that covers the state at, at our place. And it's run by a guy who won a Pulitzer Prize covering state government. And so he has seen that coverage just evaporate over 20 years. Um, the, the answer is getting enough revenue to do it and getting rid of companies that have to have 20% profit margin. And I think that's going to happen because there aren't going to be 20% profit margin. Uh, you're going to have to have people who will run newspapers who will be happy with 10%. And you just ask any grocer in this country if they would be happy with 10%. That's about three times what they make. So there's going to have to be an adjustment of the frame of news organizations. TV is always going to make a lot of money. But, but, but text-oriented, formerly newspaper companies, uh, you're going to have to have changes. And this has actually happened. I've heard of uh, people who run private companies, and they're bullish. They're invested. They see this as something that will happen. Now, it's mostly local, and as we emerge, but, but they also do this on television, smartphones, e-readers, so, so to them, it's, it's all one thing. But they are investing in news and newspapers. The Scripps Corporation, I heard uh, the CEO speak about three weeks ago. And that's what he said. Uh, the people who run the Columbus Dispatch said the same thing. The people, the family who run the, the Toledo Blake said the same thing. So we're going to have to see a different form of ownership than we've seen the past 30 years. You're just not going to be able to maintain 20% profit. So I, I would be terribly depressed, but we've got to get out of the recession. People have got to start making money and spending money. And I'm not sure that's going to be any time in the next five years. I mean, it, it may be a while. But it'll happen. I think it'll happen because there will be value. Okay, this concludes our actually uh, first uh, in the series of the Singular Special Series. Thank you both for coming. <laughs>